Hello, everyone. I hope you're okay. Um, weather's looking quite crazy outside, um, but it's okay in here. Um, thanks for inviting me, Nico, um, to talk today. Um, the, the talk, I'm, I'm not a landscape architect, I, I, um, but I'm really interested in nature and the city. I, I have a, a nature-based solutions project with the EU, and I've been looking at we're developing a park in in Northern Ireland, and I've been thinking a lot about about the future of of landscape in the city, really. And this, this and this work comes out of um, a conversation I had originally with um, people at, in New York City, and then I ran a project with um, master's students at Cornell University about about rewilding the city, and. Um, the idea of the project really came from a, a, a drunken conversation with um, Rob Rogamer, um, um, when when we were we were saying why aren't things more radical, and um, I, in an act of hubris, and uh, apologies to to Dirk, um, I, I I hacked um, one of Dirk's. Um, famous tables about about how the city was changing, and and he said the city's gone from contrast to contact to contract, and we're in this ecosystem services idea, and I thought that was very anthropocentric as an idea of nature, and I said there's got to be a another layer where we finally lose control, you know, where where we give control to nature that where you can't tell the difference between nature and the city. That the city is somehow contingent. That actually nature has as much a right to be there as we do, and we can't we can't just think nature is great because it provides ecosystem services. So, and I really like this quote from it's a, from a sci-fi book actually um, by Carl Schroeder called Permanence, where where he says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. Basically, either advanced alien civilizations don't exist, or we can't see them because they're indistinguishable from natural systems. So he, he in the book, there's loads of aliens, but they're all hiding as trees and plants and winds and things, <laughs> things that nature has. And I really like that idea. And so a, a lot of the work's based on, on that sort of idea. And when I looked at this idea of contingent, I realized it's sort of, I like the vision of the city from metropolis to low to metabolic. And then this idea of, of the Garden of Eden at the end, that somehow you're so in nature, it's just fantastic to be there. And of course, the city has has loads of problems, you know, but also it 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 changes that duality of man and nature from, from being a completely separate thing to sort of, somehow we have to hybridize that. And, you know, and I, and I, I got really interested. I realized reading more and more about rewilding that it that it, it's it's not just about adding interesting creatures into a landscape. You know, it, it's 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 about creating a dynamic equilibrium. You know, that I think our ideas of conservation are based on a a, a too recent past or something. I suppose that's the idea, and that and that really the natural systems are not just pre-industrial but pre-organized agriculture you know and, and and that's going back to the pleistocene or something so i was trying to get a, a sort of definition this comes from jepson and blythe which is a really good book if you're interested in in um, rewilding and probably the only really theoretical book that's been written about it so far and you know, and 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 actually, the things it talks about, like systems thinking, are the sorts of things that urbanists have been talking about for some time. That this city is is a series of metabolic systems and things, which is really interesting. And I particularly like the bottom two: this idea of going from a static equilibrium of a park and a street to a a dynamic system where you don't know whether you're in the park or the street. You know, the, can it be both? Can it be another? And then I suppose we're going from a sort of modernist idea of the city with buildings and green things to a new 
anthropocenic version of the city where we've got climate chaos, we've got other things happening. We've got to somehow muddle our way through incredible changes of this century. And we haven't got many friends. <laughs> I always think of that biodiversity as being a collection of friends, you know, and the, the, the more of that we reduce, the less friends we've got to really help us with it. All the ecosystem engineers get taken out of the system, don't they? You know, and I suppose that will be something quite interesting. And then my own work in lots of things re relies on, I always come back to these, these two texts really. The text of Gaia theory that there's, that they that life on Earth is a, is an eco ecological property, and that the things, the living things on Earth, are controlling um, the Earth's temperature within reason to keep the the planet suitable for living things, and that they use they're using um, con sophisticated control systems to do that. And it's still a really interesting book, and of course, it's written by a physicist who was looking for um, planets with life on in other, in other galaxies and noticed that the Earth is the wrong temperature for, for how far away it is from the sun because the greenhouse effect on the Earth has kept it quite a lot warmer than it should be. And therefore, he said, if you can spot the greenhouse effect on a planet, you can find life. And that's where the idea of Gaia theory came from. And then I really like Kevin Kelly, who was the founding editor of Wired magazine, who's a sort of polymath, computer guy, crazy man, but he wrote a book called Out of Control. And in that, the last chapter is, is called The Nine Laws of God, that looks for this, the, this future of a sort of biomimetic understanding of the world and how the new future is going to be about biomimicry. And, and this is what he calls the, the rules of it about randomly distributing things you know he, he mentions in the book about things like why does a a cherry tree produce 35,000 cherry trees a year to only have to produce a new tree every every 40 years these are crazy systems but he says it's it's about distributing being you know and there's a range of others it's it's a really good good read if you if you're interested and you can buy it because it's an old book you can buy it for 99 cents second hand on on um, amazon at present so worth a worth a pop if you've got a spare a spare euro you know um and then when i started obviously i said i'd do the project and then i then i just kept having dreams this is the dream here i'm i'm thinking you know they talk about large-scale herbivores knocking things over high-level carnivores in the city aurochs you know mammoths you know to do the these things we need to rewild these landscapes and i'm thinking this is a city and i'm thinking wolves city mm, mammoths city <laughs> yeah how are these going to fit into this this system and and, and so and, and that dream for the weeks before the project i was it became a sort of a, a daily nightmare or nightly night uh, of, of panicking about how I was going to not put wolves in the city, you know, or maybe do I put wolves in the city? And then I would all go from those sorts of things. And then I suppose I was trying to find some way of, of carving up the project so I could do a lot of work that was sort of propositional without sort of too much detail getting in the way or something. Because obviously a city of 15 million people is quite difficult to deal with, you know, and I, I like the idea, you know, of the three C's, which is one of the ideas of, of rewilding, really, and um, cause, corridors, carnivores. The word carnivore came up again, a bit worried about that. We'll deal with that as we go along. And I, I think it's, it's quite interesting. I, I, I'd done a project previously about rewilding the Lake District in, in England. And the major achievement of that project was, was to get a series of bumper stickers made by farmers that said conservation, yes, rewilding, no. And they often had those, you see them stuck on tractors now. So that seemed to be the only, the only impact that project had that farmers began to hate me, which was quite interesting. Um, but, uh, but from it, I learned a lot about 
the sort of scale of landscapes and, and the scale that you need to rewild. And so, so the key ideas for the project really are that the city is made up of two things, you know, cores, objects, and then connected tissue, something that connects those things. And I suppose I took this idea that rewilding would have to take place in both of those domains in some ways and happen at a range of scales that made some sort of sense at the city scale, but maybe also at the building scale or the facade scale or something like that. And then I really like this quote from Theo Crosby, um, grass is the enemy of cities. I was thinking like, yeah, it can't just, it can't just turn into a sort of, a sort of park, a giant park. It's gotta be sort of something bigger than that. And, and then there's all the things you think about when you come to these sort of things, obviously you've got urban issues of just the fact the city is and it's doing things every day and you know people are in the subway people are having lunch people are doing all those sort of things so i have to think about all those things obviously climate you can't do anything now without thinking about the horrors of this century you know and 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 what's going to happen with that then there's the the question of ecologies and the scales that are needed to create ecologies and the size of the city and then this idea of the living creatures, you know, can we, what size of creature can fit in a city? Can you make a miniature ecology with miniature creatures in? Rob and I wrote a book once called uh, Why We Need Small Cows, which was about urban agriculture, saying, well, we need some really small cows to fit in this thing, you know, about this big, so no, then we can hide them in the city, you know. And, and then I was thinking, can technology and politics and policy be our friend you know can, can we use those often as designers we 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 shun new technologies we shun policy scapes and and politics but maybe they could they could help us too in create create the dream you know and then what sort of systematic changes do we really want because if this is going to be about a systems approach then what systems are extant in the city and which ones do we need to add and how do we need to make that, that sort of happen? And then just this, and then I kept coming back to this idea of climate and um, I'm doing another talk <laughs> at half past four in the Bow Pub, if, if, if this finished in town where I'm talking about doing some stuff on some of the projects I've done on climate change. And, and some of the, on, on those projects I worked with the University of Exeter that does the, Brit the British government modeling of future climates. And when I got the data and put it into some architectural software to visualize the climate, I nearly died with fear because it, they were, these are there's really frightening climates right, coming, coming up, you know, in the model. And, and somehow we, we've got to find some way of dealing with those, you know, and obviously, you know, that more than most being below sea level, just like New York is. New York's sinking as it is. It's been terraformed to a position where it's almost at sea level anyway. And so this is just, you know, mid-century, end of century, um, sea level rise in, in New York City. It's absolutely crazy, really, when you look at it. And these are very tame numbers, which will probably be far surpassed. Um, so I'm going to go through a range of the projects that we did at different scales, either object or connective. And um, this first one is is looking at Manhattan as a whole and about can we make a permeable landscape where which which is shared equally by humans and creatures. And um, obviously Manhattan sits in a bigger landscape and these projects could extend quite happily across the whole of the the uh, metropolis but for this one urban heat island is an amazing problem in in new york city you know parts of the city are, are six or seven degrees above above the um, natural temperature in summer and this summer temperatures have been past 40 degrees c on the street you know so and and so all over the city there's real problems with with the urban heat island effect. And so maybe there's an ecosystem service by trying to insert a more 
permeable landscape into this that you can connect more people with more green stuff that with the transpiration effect you might be able to lower the temperature so what we tried to do was create this sort of um it's actually a thompson blue tartan i, I was looking at we we're looking at different tartans and and the the the, sh the colors and patterns of them to see if we could find a pattern that would fit new york that would allow for a change from this gridiron system into greening certain streets greening certain roofs connecting different bits of building with larger areas for for cause to happen and store water to feed it all and so we sort of created this this new grid that sits within the new york grid that creates a a, a patchwork to connect shore to shore across the the city and it's quite interesting obviously to do that we need a three-dimensional natural city to sit within the city because we can't fill just the ground floor with um, this this natural system so the idea was that we build this structure out of um, waste paper and we would then seed it with things that, that could grow and provide a sort of three-dimensional system over time while the paper rotted the the sort of climbing plants and the trees would would then take the place of the paper and eventually create this this natural system which would then completely fill the city so it would be this sort of water catching cardboard super surface that ran through the city and sort of connected it and allowed for to basically make the um the whole of Manhattan be a hundred percent green when you looked at it from Google Earth, basically. That was that was the idea. Made with recycled cardboard. <laughs> so so the, the second project is a meso scale one. And it looks at how how do we create the dynamism that's needed for rewilding? You know, rewilding relies basically on the trashing of 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 mature landscapes by large herbivores <laughs> you know that's one of the key ideas in the system that that you need stuff to be churned over all the time to create the biodiversity that you need and the stasis is is one of the problems and we were sat there at the time doing the project with smoke from forest fires in canada turning the city yellow you know and and, and these forest fires happening because all the trees are exactly the same age they're all managed forests in in, in um, the quebec area and they're all the same age they've got the same density of dryness in the wood they and therefore they're easy to burn down you know and and because they haven't had enough churning because we've lost at least 29 species of great large pachyderms since the last ice age um, and they were doing a lot of trashing before that so this one looks at olmstead's um central park central park's quite interesting because it's seen as this this sort of natural lung in the city it's actually actually olmstead based it on birkenhead park in 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 liverpool which is even more bizarre because because birkenhead is such a sad lonely place if you ever go there <laughs> and yet new york's thriving obviously the, the shape of the park doesn't really matter in terms of the economic benefit of the city which is quite interesting but but the interesting thing about central park is it's got really stuck you know it's covered with with you know tree protection orders on everything you know and but the interesting thing about it is the the value it gives to real estate next to it, it is absolutely phenomenal properties with it which front the park are four times more expensive than ones that don't. So that gave me an idea that there might be a way of changing the idea of the park, make it more dynamic, its edge, to put more people next to the edge of the park. And that means that we could pay for it through the increase in, in wealth of the, of the properties that sit around the park. So, and I thought, you know, it'd be a swap from, 
from these large herbivores to mechanical versions of things that demolish stuff that we would we would we would invent mechanical versions of 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 the large herbivores and we would go around trashing stuff which america really likes to do anyway so so that would it would suit the american mindset i, I shouldn't say that it's because recorded but anyway um it's really good so the idea the idea of the project is is that what happens is that every year the the parks broken down into a series of pixels and every year one of the pixels in the parks gets trashed and two new ones are built in the city that connect it and so what happens is at the moment it's manhattan is is 16.8 central parks so over time manhattan becomes a giant central park through this continuous trashing of landscapes so and what it does it makes loads of it makes the edge of the park really permeable very quickly. And that adds loads of value to all the real estate that sits next to the park. And the park grows every every year by two pixels because it, it loses one but goes goes two and the new one gets developed. So it it creates this this new sort of landscape that starts to crack Central Park open and grow towards towards the the um seascape. And over time creates this amazing linear fractal new park that's continually being churned over. And sometimes the park go is on the ground, sometimes it goes through buildings, over buildings, and it sort of creates this new sort of super central park that's where everyone's next to Central Park. And in one in the future, everyone will have a parkside residence, which would be great, won't it? <clears throat> and so the, these are some of the developments here where we go from one central park and over 30 years you end up with a six times central park area eventually in, in 30 years which is really quite interesting and these are some of the typologies of how that thing might fit within the within the city at, at the micro scale and the connective thing there's some really interesting thing. We, we thought we'd look at Wall Street, which is quite interesting because because Wall Street, when you think of that diagram of the of the city from from Dirk's work, you know, Wall Street was, you know, a wall, you know, beyond Wall Street originally was wilderness, you know, and inside was the city. So Wall Street is quite interesting because it, it embodies one of the ideas, one of the problems of the, the city, I suppose. And Wall Street also has this amazing thing that it's basically at sea level. So, and actually, it's actually sinking by 20 centimeters a year, roughly, because of the weight of the buildings on it. So, it's, it, and it's also got the most vacancies it's ever had. People aren't moving back into those offices. Some of them being turned into apartments, some of them are being just left empty. And so, it's a really interesting problem for the city. But obviously, Wall Street has this thing, what Wall Street does today, the world does tomorrow is the famous quote, isn't it? And Wall Street, the development of Wall Street created the development of the grid anyway, and the rights to light and the other policy scapes. New York has an incredibly low number of policy statements for development. It actually only has um, 11 policy statements about development in the city. And I think the 11th one is that the, the mayor can override the other 10 if he wants. <laughs> so they have no policy, really, <laughs> which is quite interesting, you know, which, which, which makes it quite interesting, you know, compared to Birkenhead, which we counted 839 policy statements when we did a project there, which may be why Birkenhead's failing miserably, because you can't do anything without breaching one of them. Um, so, so the idea was, but I was also interested really in the idea that whether you could make a, a policy scape that was financially driven, that would be pro nature. So you start to say to companies, if you provide 25% of your surface area of your building as, as nature friendly, you can get a 1% reduction in, in state taxes. You know, and so you end up in creating a, a policy scape that, that makes things inevitable to green the city. 
and then and this involves things like dealing with the fact that sea level rise is going to flood Wall Street soon, that you might make different surfaces in there because you might there might be benefits for producing um, aquaculture landscapes. So therefore, that then makes people say, actually, it's worth hanging a, a sort of giant fish pond off the side of our building because that makes money you know and so you just so so we invent a new policy scape that that finance financially rates all the different bits of 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 things we want to happen in the city and that rewilds it in a different way because you get the the wolf of wall street thing where where actually people are doing it doing the right thing for all the wrong reasons which i quite like the idea of you know that that actually that we, we don't seem to be able to get people to do the right thing for the right reasons. So wouldn't it be great if they did the right things for the wrong reasons? You know, and that would be be really, I think, really quite quite interesting. And if and if Wall Street does it today, then the rest of the world does it tomorrow. So it's like it's like the best test bed you can have for it. And then, you know, the, this thing about about extreme sea level rise, you know, a lot of the the numbers to do with sea level rise are, are based on IPCC numbers, which are very, very, very conservative. And one thing, if if we get to say a seven degrees C rise for the planet, which is looks unfortunately likely by the end of the century, <laughs> which is really frightening, that means that that all the ice in the world will melt. And it, that includes all the ice on Everest, all the ice everywhere, and Antarctica. And if that happens, it's probably about a 59 meter sea level rise. Right? Doesn't do. So move to Maastricht, I think, is the, <laughs> is, is the, what you might learn from, from, from that. Um, but, but to certainly, New York has nowhere that's above 59 meters, apart from the buildings. So, you know, that, so, so the fact is, I suppose one thing we, we never think about is how far ahead should we be thinking? Because these are our problems that we're cascading onto our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, our great-great-great-grandchildren, aren't they? And so, so we should have a plan for them. And we, we generally only think a very short distance in, in front. So, but it's really hard to think of those sorts of distances in the future, isn't it? You know, to think of a, a 400, 500 year future for New York, you know, when it's only been there 200 years. It's, it's an interesting challenge for all of us, isn't it? And um, so on this one, we start to imagine how amazingly rewilded the sea will be when that sea level rises it actually it actually creates the the rewilded ocean you know because it creates this amazing reef system <laughs> that's uh, full of buildings and things so it's actually great for nature in a way you know that actually it, it actually sorts out all the problems of this of the sea because it creates this incredible reef system but what does it do for people obviously it makes a problem and, and one of the ways we we start to see New York as this archipelago of self-sufficient sort of, I, I don't know, I was thinking of Aeolus. It's like a, like a version of Aeolus or something, you know, if you're, if you're interested in the Odyssey or something. And, and you know, that where, where there's this sort of city of the winds sat in the sea somewhere that's, that collects its own water and its own energy and sits there. And, and in fact, what we imagine is that it, it, it increases its size by by importing all the world's um, oil rigs, which will now be redundant anyway, because there's no oil left. So you collect them all around New York to make the real estate that you've lost from the sea level rise. And they will sit all around the city, making a new sort of rusty steel city in that space. And, and like I say, it, it, it sort of is automatic rewilding because because Manhattan sort of disappears into into the into the sea. And actually, the the coastal shelf in New York is relatively small. And so actually, it, it, it gives quite an increase in in the in the amount of, of surface for that. And. Could be amazing. <laughs> good, to, good to go um, scuba diving, I think, in, in that sort of landscape, but. 
but also you know it, it, it's sort of apocryphal in, in that it tells a story that that the planet's going to survive isn't it the, the the creature that's most likely to to not survive it are humans actually in this in this um climate future that we'll just be a dirty stain in a rock you know about this thick you know somewhere where and they'll say i wonder what that was and you say yeah that was that was civilization <laughs> it only lasted a few hundred years it just left a load of mess and you can see it in this rock strata you know that actually that the because I suppose that rewilding of the city will will probably not eventually include humans. Um, so here's this Aeolus idea of the of the the leftover bits of the city sitting here in this in this rewilded sea. Could be great. Um, this next one is the meso scale, looking at at making real serious connections for for migration. Because one thing's for sure, the climate in America is moving at about 11 kilometers a year at the moment. So a 100-year-old tree will be a 1,000 years out of range, a 1,000 kilometers out of range by the, time, you know, by the time it's fully grown, which is a really interesting challenge for trees. <laughs> you know, but, that, but it also means that other creatures are going to have to migrate to stay in zone, aren't they? And the city and the this sort of metropolis of the coast is a real barrier to, to migration. So this looked at, at whether we could create a series of connective tissues at a large scale that could allow for large scale migration through the city, which didn't really get in the way. Brooklyn Bridge isn't really used very much anymore. It's actually, most people walk on it or cycle on it. It's actually not big enough to, to support the things. It doesn't, doesn't really go to the right places anymore. And the replacement bridge, is more suitable. So the idea was, could you make a, a multi-layered bridge that that rewilded, made a corridor, provided food, connected with the seascape and sequestered carbon through seagrass and through other other things in in a system that that would run through the city. And so the city, the, the bridge becomes this multi-layered landscape of food, energy, wilderness, and water-based systems of wilderness and, and food that sit there, which I think could be quite a nice project really, and really would allow, you know, probably if this were done around the, the Eastern seaboard would create a lot more permeability for, for migration because it's a quite a difficult landscape to move through. And here you can see various things enjoying <laughs> the journey. And then this project is looking at small scale things. I, 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 a lot of the small scale parks in you know New York has had this this system of uh, pocket parks, you know, where really quite small bits of of green space have been dotted inside the city, you know, and there's less less of them then there probably needs to be, you know, but they're all quite interesting in the, in that they're, they're all incredibly manicured and often over time they've, they've had green stuff removed from them and more physical systems put in, inside. For example, Zuccotti Park where Occupy Wall Street started has had a load of anti-personnel devices put in it, you know, to try and prevent people congregating there. And, but it's meant lots of surfaces, hard surfaces put in the park. And so I was really interested if, if, if somehow we could imagine a sort of network of those that could work together, but they're so disconnected. I was really interested about what sort of network they might, they might make if you had some sort of connection between all these pocket parks. And, and I had this idea that what we'd do is that we'd, we'd make this stacked pocket park of different climates so what we do is we'd use we'd use heat pumps to heat and cool different layers of the park so we'd have the park would sit on the ground with the current um, climate and then what you do is you could cool various layers by using a heat pump to take heat out of them so you could get previous climates from new york from the last ice age 
and you could then warm other places and get future cli future New York climates inside this this sort of stacked park. And so you could go and visit, you know, be like the ghosts of Christmas past and Christmas future. That you could go and see previous climates and go and visit future climates. And these these parks could then be a sort of a test bed for seeing what grows and and survives in in various future climates in in New York and there'd be there'd be research things and there'd be educational things and you could go and you could sit in the in the tundra climate park in the middle of summer and enjoy the cool of of being with arctic foxes and and, and such things while you know and in winter you could go to maybe the desert park and and enjoy the Arizona or the Florida, or you could go to the hot, humid landscapes of of the Everglades and and sit there and and watch alligators um, catch ducks and things. You know, so you you could actually enjoy, you could get out of the New York climate because what happens in New York is everybody tells me, you know, oh it's lucky you're here in June because. Once you get to July, the best place to go is upstate. <laughs> you know, but actually, the, the, the summer's becoming almost unbearable of July and August. But here, you'll be able to go to a park that's like an Arctic winter, if you want, you know, which I thought was quite quite interesting idea. And it was all powered renewably through algae arrays that, that use pollutants in the city, produce biofuels that can be used to power the heat pumps that allow us to transfer the heat and cool around the, the park. And so you end up sitting in this stack of multiple parks that, that give you hints of your future landscape and also act as a sort of research ground. And here you are in different in the building looking out on these crazy landscapes that can be created in this stack tower that enjoy the different climates that are coming your way soon. And so just to, to finish off, I, I suppose the idea of the city as, as Garden of Eden, you know, it's possible, you know, whether it's probable is another thing, you know, I think, I think we, we have the ability to design whatever we want. You know, I think that's one of the, one of the beauties of being a designer, isn't it? You can imagine anything you want. I think one of the problems is we're often limited by the things we've designed by whether they're possible or probable. I don't really think that's should be a, because I think all bets are off on the future. So I think we should be able to design whatever future we want. You know, and I suppose one of the ideas of rewilding is that, is that it's quite radical in its thing. So, and you know, and I suppose what rewilding tells us is we can't appease the city. The city can't run the show anymore. You know, we've we've got to lose control of that system and let biological systems run the city somehow. And that means, and that that means a new radical idea about landscape architecture, doesn't it? About setting systems up to do things and letting them go and not having to control them so much and just being being amazed at what they do and then like i was saying that this climate change is is changing is going to change everything so we're going to need a new regime aren't we to deal with that i, th I think i think you know i i always think of the the first ecological experiment was done by jj Priestley in my home city of Manchester in in 1768, he did the bell jar experiment where he put a a mouse and a candle in a bell jar and the candle went out and the mouse died. And then he put some plants, a mouse and a bell jar uh, and, a, and a candle in a bell jar and the mouse and lived after the candle had burnt out, the mouse continued living. And he said, there is an amazing flux in this world between animals and plants that means they they can live together but they can't live on their own and he had no and i was just thinking you know he had no idea about you know sort of chemistry hadn't been invented atomic theory hadn't been invented. he had no idea what was going on within that bell jar 
but capitalism was 100 years old at that time. You know, so capitalism was invented with no understanding of ecology whatsoever. And so there's no way that capitalism can 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 save the planet. <laughs> That's all I keep thinking, which is a, a sort of radical position, I know, but I can't see any other answer. And that means, and if the city is the is the concretization of capitalism, then the city also has to be demolished and change, you know, because we need these new rituals that create new ways of living. And I was the quote from the famous quote from Kevin Kelly that I'll end the lecture with, is, which is, the future will be born and not made. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Really inspiring. And uh, then you took us to all corners <laughs> of uh, Miro and philosophical uh, approaches and uh, well uh, food for thought so yeah. really thank you very much really great uh other questions yeah um i really like the idea that you embraced of kind of letting go and more going with the flow, if I understand that correctly. Um, so to be more adaptive instead of spending more time on thinking how the future could be. Um, and in the specific case of New York, I had to think about, I had a guest lecture by, I think the bureau is called One Architecture in New York. Yeah. They oh, yeah. uh, did the whole redesign of lower Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I had to think about it in that context because they really had this large scale redesign. I'm sure you're pro probably aware of it. Yeah. And they had all of these issues between different stakeholders, which took so much time to actually implement it. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious what, what your view is on being able to, yeah, just going with the flow, as you said, and um, maybe also spending less time on thinking instead of doing things. Yeah. Um, and all the issues you have, because you say nature first, but of course there's also always people to it that have different interests and issues. So what is your view on kind of that duality? Yeah, that, that, that's quite interesting because my one of the other projects I've got at the moment is this is this upsurge project, which is an EU funded project looking at nature based solutions. And I'm, I'm running the dealing with stakeholders part of that <laughs> as, part, as, as well as designing some things in it. And it's really interesting. But what, what I've realized from working with stakeholders is is they they you can't let them hold the pen when you're designing things. That's what I've realized, you know, that actually they're not, you know, so what I try and do with the stakeholders I work with is, is we co-design the vision and then, and then I work out how to get the vision to come true <laughs> as a designer. <laughs> so, so I get some peace and quiet on my own, <laughs> you know, but, but, but actually, and, and that's really interesting because, because actually people have, you, it's really easy to build consensus for a vision actually, because actually the, usually the vision, if you said, does New York have to be more green in the future? Yes. How green? Yeah, it's got to be completely green. We've got to, you, when you talk to stakeholders, they'll tell you all those things. And actually that really empowers you as a designer. But if you say design, hold the pen, you know, they, they end up being very conservative. And, and I, I, think, I think the days of being conservative are over you know I, I i think i think we're we've got to become much more radical and 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 the stakeholders need to know that too don't they and and you know certainly some of the projects we've done with citizen with with andy van der doppelstein i had a project with him when we we're in places like amersfoort the most radical people were the most unlikely people you know 70 year old men and women telling us we need massive change in, in this town. It, you know, I don't want to leave it like this, you know, and, and that was really interesting, you know, that actually it was, it was the middle aged people who were the most conservative, you know, the, the head of, um, the, the, in, in Elberg, the head, the head of um, um, conservation walked out because when I, when I, when I asked, um, how do you explain 400, um, heritage buildings with really high carbon usage to people in the Maldives. 
and he and because he had no answer he just he stormed out and and not knocked all my papers off the desk <laughs> because it's really interesting isn't it that actually you know we're in a very privileged position in europe aren't we because we don't really see the real impact of those things you know but actually you know we, we're going to have to get really radical about what we what we're going to save and what we what we have to get rid of you know and and, and, that, and i think that, that is going to be a challenge and and we don't spend enough time talking to stakeholders as, as at university do we really I, I think or how to deal with it there are hardly any theories about dealing with stakeholders which which i found really interesting when i was trying to find some way to deal with it because it's all rules of thumb <laughs> you know there's no theory about it Can, I, can you just reflect maybe on you've done a lot of really interesting um, design research projects and but and you and one of them was for instance like the policy based one which is really interesting sort of tapping into the the regulation and the and those can you like having done them all can you reflect back on which ones are really interesting yeah, or yeah. really uh, specific or perhaps New York or tapping into maybe the the psych of the city or tapping into kind of like a kind of New kind of city. Which ones will work? And, yeah. and what? So, how do you actually? What have you learned from the from the research? I suppose that's the yeah. I, that's, that's that's a really good question. I think um, I was I was thinking. Um, you know, I really like the policy scapes because because I I, th I think I think that often we leave the design of the policy scape to someone who doesn't know anything about design, and that's a really interesting problem, isn't it? And and actually, and that's the thing that's caused a separation really between landscape and architecture and between you know urban planning and, and architecture because because that policy scape is is created by other people and and, and so, I, so i really like the policy scape thing that that you might create a set of rules that that are going to generate stuff you don't know you've got some idea that's going to happen but it, but it actually has a life of its own and, and i think so the so so i, I really like the the the, the um the wall street one because because i could really see that making financial benefit for certain things good things is a really interesting idea because we always imagine you know they always say it, ta it takes religion to get a good person to do a bad thing don't they but the the, the opposite side is is lots of people do good things for the wrong reason you know and, and is that a problem <laughs> you know so I, li I like the idea of getting people to do good things for the wrong reason so so if you can make it so that arch capitalists do the right thing because they they want to make money then that makes sense to me somehow because i think that's the most the quickest way to get change is to people think they're making money from it somehow so you see that with farmers don't you that that actually that we were just talking before about the agricultural landscape being a disaster mainly because farmers chase money all the time don't they and maybe if the money were position to to do something else with the landscape they might make the landscape good <laughs> you know so that so that would be the thing i really like the i also like the the central park one because i like the idea of that that increased edge because that's a, one of the kevin kelly's ideas is is honor the fringe maximize the fringe you know and so the idea that you you crack open Central Park, and and you you even if you don't cre increase its area, you increase its surface area, and that adds so much value to the to the lands to the actual built stuff that you can probably do more with the park in that way, and that would be really interesting too, I think. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. I have, I have one, uh, Greg, which is, <clears throat> you showed a really nice overview of, and, and then you asked and also an interesting question, uh, which one, uh, did, did you get publicity with this? And uh, yes, what, what did they say? And uh, you know what I mean? What was the, yeah, did you yeah, get publicity it, it, and what was the reaction? How did, how did that? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we had an exhibition at the end of the, the project and, and there's a there's a book of the project as well. Um, and and I I, th I think I I, th I think what's what's become really interesting in the in the past you know I'm quite old really and um, and I've been doing you know projects about this sort of uh, about sustainability since the 1980s you know and th there was a time when people threw things at me 
when I presented the projects, <laughs> you know, because they said they were stupid or they, you're an idiot or that's never going to happen or whatever. But I've noticed in the past 10 years, there's been an incredible acceptance of the projects that I've done. Either I'm not getting radical enough, maybe I've lost my edge, you know, maybe that's that's the thing. But but I've just noticed that people are such are realizing that regime change has to happen. I think there's a real feeling of that. So everyone came into the thing and said, this is amazing. This needs to happen. Why isn't this happening? And, you know, which 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 was quite incredible, you know, and, and this included people from the city, you know, engineers and architects around the city, people who work in museums who were there, you know, and, and they're all saying this needs to happen, you know. And 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 so you realize that that's that I, I also think that something's happened with city governance, that the intelligence it had in modernist times in the 1960s, there were most of the clever people went to work in the city for the city doing architecture or landscape. Now, you know, the, there aren't many clever people in, in the city governments in the same level of quality. And I think that's a real shame for the city, isn't it? I think and that's near enough every city we work with sort of lacks that, you know, it has hardly any young people working for the city. There's there's no visions. Everything's about just making good, keeping stakeholders happy, <laughs> doing all that. And there's no radical views anymore, you know, which which I think is a real, a real pity. And, and and that's certainly true in 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 New York. You know, they're building a they're building a dike at the moment on the edge of Wall Street, into the Hudson, that's seven meters high. And they're going to they're just making a bigger Manhattan. And they're going to they're paying for the wall by selling all the real estate off that's underwater on the other side of the wall, <laughs> you know. And I just thought, have you not learned the lesson yet? <laughs> you know, you know. But 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 you know, the city just goes ka-ching, money. You know, like great, we're short of money. We can we can make this happen. So the you know, and and so New York hasn't hasn't got any vision really beyond making more money, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, please another round of applause for Greg okay. and then we move on. Thank you. <clears throat>